have at least one of our authors here, and here's the way the best laid plans go. Um, we have two fabulous authors planned for tonight. One of them, I believe, may be stuck in traffic on his way down from Maine. And so when he comes, I'll just introduce him. <laughs> Meanwhile, um, I want to start with the evening. Um, we are in for a special treat tonight. Um, Amy specializes in writing novels that explore the inner reaches of the human heart. She is the author of Outside the Lines, Best Kept Secret, and The Language of Sisters. She lives in Seattle with her family, and there's a lot more I can tell you about her, but I'm hoping she'll share some of it with us. Um, all I will say is that there, a lot of us have found out that social workers in sociology do not lead to do uh, necessarily employment. <laughs> Heart Like Mine was well received by reviewers and booklets in the New York Times, but this review from Goodreads says it all. I highly recommend you pick up a copy of your own books. By the way, they're available right over there for signing. I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of your own. This was a deeply moving story about a father, his children, and his fiance, dealing with the fallout of the mother's death and the secret she kept hidden most of her life. Bring tissues. Amy Hackman, a paints a realistic picture of a broken family, a father's new life, and a chasm between his children and his fiance that opens even wider when the mother dies under mysterious circumstances. And with that, let's have, oh, welcome Amy. Far away from the subject matter. 
And you, you, basically the fact that I stopped listening after she said you're never going to be published, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I decided that I wasn't going to be a writer. It really, you know, it wounded me because I've always been a really emotional person. I kind of live life very close to the surface. I absorb the world around me. Um, I feel things very emphatically. Um, I grew up with a sister who has special needs and she couldn't speak. And so I think that living with her my entire life really brought that out in me. I had to really intuit how she felt. I had to figure out what her needs were, her emotional needs, her physical needs, all of those things. And so that's just sort of bled into who I am as a person. And so I spend a lot of my time reading people and I'm you know, pretty quick judge of character and what's going on with a person emotionally. Um, and the fact that this professor told me that I wasn't gonna be published because my writing reflected too much of that you know, was pretty wounding. Um, of course, about six years later, I sent her my first novel. <laughs> um, because I graduated and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I studied sociology, and then I graduated and discovered that most sociologists are unemployed because I didn't want to be a professor. And so about a year out of college, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this. And I quit my job, and I sold my car, and I started writing my first novel. And at 27, it came out. So I published two novels in my 20s, had two books and two babies, and uh, then took a little bit of a break for a few years. And then, I guess about four years ago, I was lucky enough to come up with an idea for a book called Best Kept Secret. And I was, it, the story idea really nagged at me. I was really interested in the media, um, the treatment of mothers and alcoholism, and sort of the mommies who need wine culture, and what happens when one of them crosses that line. And so this idea of a woman who was um, in a custody battle for her son because of her drinking problem, she was now sober, um, was really compelling for me. And I was really blessed when I was uh, picked up by Atria Books and I've been with them ever since. And so Heart Like Mine, which just came out a little while ago, is the story of blended families. Now, I was initially inspired by the idea of a woman who didn't want children, because I have a very close friend of mine who is childless by choice, and she's faced a lot of judgment and challenges in her life because people think there's something wrong with her, that um, she's missing a gene, or you know she's not as nurturing as she should be, or whatever, because something because she doesn't want children. And I'm like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Because she's one of the most loving, generous, amazing women that I know. And so I started kind of looking into it culturally and kind of reading online different blogs from Childless by Choice Women and Men. And um, I found that, you know, she was not alone in the judgment that she had faced. And so I started to think about a woman, a character, who was of that same nature. She was a compassionate, loving, wonderful woman, didn't want kids. So then, of course, as a writer, my job is to find the absolute most challenging hard circumstance to put her in, so I made her fall in love with a man who was divorced and had two children. <laughs> um, and then of course, again, I have to take it to a harder place, and I say, what's even harder than that? So the next thing would be that their mother dies, and the children have to come and live with them. So this woman who is completely unprepared for motherhood, thinking, well, maybe I could be a good part-time stepmother, all of those things, but then when they come to live with her full time and her fiance, you know, the reality of that is so much different. And on top of that, you've got the layer of the grief that these children are facing in having just lost their mother. And especially to make it, you know, a little more challenging for them is they're not really sure how their mother died. There's some challenging circumstances around that. Um, Grace, who is the character who isn't sure she wants to have children, um, she runs a not-for-profit agency that helps women who have been abused kind of get back on their feet and build a new life. And so she's very career-driven, she's very passionate about the work she does, and her fiancé Victor owns a restaurant, he's self-employed, very, very busy. And so when 13-year-old Ava and 7-year-old Max move into the house, you know, Victor hasn't been with them full-time for many years as well. He's been used to being a part-time father. and. So the dynamics just, just come together in this big mess. And then they have to carefully try to pull those strands out and figure out how they can balance their life together. Ava, of course, is deeply, deeply affected by the loss of her mother. Her mother was not terribly stable, and Ava did a lot of caretaking as, you know, from a young childhood, um, helping this woman who was not really mentally well 
And so Ava sort of takes it upon herself to sort of figure out how her mother became the woman she was and how she died and what it was that led her mom to become so fragile and, and so broken. Because um, Ava had some fears about becoming that way herself. And Grace, in the same way, wants to understand what happened because she's afraid that her engagement to Victor has thrown this woman over the edge because Kelly, who is the woman who, who died, was still very much in love with her ex-husband. And so there's two different people, and we have Grace and Ava who are looking for the same information and struggling every day in their relationship with each other. And you've got you know, an emotional 13-year-old. Now, I'm a stepmother to an emotional 13-year-old, <laughs> so much of the emotional um, dynamics between the two of them are, are pulled from my own experiences as a stepmother. I love my stepdaughter, who I call my bonus daughter, because that's really what I look at as. Um, she's a true gift in my life, but in the beginning of our relationship, there were a lot of challenges, and really trying to understand who I was in relation to her and her mother, who's alive and well. <laughs> so, um, but of course I sat down Anna first, Anna's my bonus daughter, and I would say, you know, so is it okay if I talk about how this felt and that felt? I mean, none of the situations that happened in the book happened in my life, but I wanted to make sure it was okay with her if, we talked about, if I talked about some of the emotional stuff that we had gone through. And she says, well, as long as I can read the chapters, yes. <laughs> I was like, okay. So she read the chapters for me and gave me her, you know, 13-year-old seal of approval. And um, she said, you know, you did a really good job. And you, did, you, you got how I felt, and that really freaks me out. <laughs> um, but the inner workings of my characters are always the most interesting to me. I'm not really a plot-driven author. Um, there's always a string of plot, a question that I want to answer for the reader. In this case, it's how did Kelly die? and are Grace and Victor going to be able to stay together and, and have this family. Um, but I'm really interested in the day-to-day -day ways that we as human beings are connected. And I think the one way that we are all connected across all boundaries, all nationalities, all continents, is our emotions, is how we feel. Um, it doesn't matter if I've had the same particular situation as someone living across a, a continent or an ocean from me, I know what it is to be sad, they know what it is to be sad. I know what it is to struggle, um, to be happy, to be joyous, all of those things. And if in any way as a writer that I can latch into that emotion, kind of that greater collective emotional unconscious that we all have around us in my writing and make the readers feel that way as well, then I feel like I've done my job. And I've made, hopefully, those people, my readers, part of that story as well. And it's, it's a feeling of wanting to feel connected. It's a feeling of want to, of inclusion instead of separation. Because I think that our society in general does tend to separate us, you know, especially with all the technology and all those things. Emotion connects us. And so when we talk about being a writer who writes about the inner workings of the heart, that's really my goal, is to connect people. Um, and I see that emotions are the best way to do that. So. I think that's it for me for now. Um, people, do you want to have Douglas have a chance and then we can do questions after that? I think that would be great. So, Douglas Kennedy is the author of 10 novels, including the international bestsellers, Leaving the World and the Moment. His work has been translated into 22 languages. In 2007, he received the French Declaration, which I will not read in French, um, which is essentially the night from the Order of Arts and Letters. He has four different residents, and only one is in this country. He lives in Germany and France, as well as Maine, and I forget the word. Um, you also can find many outstanding reviews for five days, um, and it's just been released. But this one, again from Goodreads, encapsulates what many have said. It is amazing how well he was able to write this story from a woman's, Laura's perspective, expressing all her pain, frustration, hopes, and dreams. This novel depicts not only the difficulty of making choices, but also how certain choices can narrow one's life rather than broaden it. And here's Douglas Kennedy.
January of 2011, it was the end of a period in my life, which had started in May of 08, the end of my 25-year marriage, which even though it was something I wanted and was leaving for nobody except for me, um, was nonetheless, um, shall we say, an emotional roller coaster. The usual sort of romantic mistakes thereafter. In January of 11, I was sitting in my house in May watching snowfall, and basically, should I move this closer? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Is that why you're moving towards me? Right? That's right. Raise it up a bit. We'll get there. Is that better? Does that work better? I'm, I'm leaner into a microphone. Anyway, I was there watching the snow fall and thinking to myself in my own way, I'm rather happy I had also just finished copy editing. About three hours later, I was running for a flight to London to visit my children at Logan Airport. And there, to the left of the line for security, was a woman in her early 40s, very stark New England features. You could imagine a John Singer Sargent painting her 150 years earlier, but not in a big puffer jacket. In floods of quiet tears, and she had her wedding ring like this. She was twisting it manically as if it was a man. Immediately, I sort of thought to myself, and I, I riff a lot when I see things like this. You know, all right, she's just put her husband on a plane. He's leaving her for another woman. She's just put her husband on a plane. She's thinking, I can't go back with him. He's such a clown. I'm going right back. Um, she's just put her lover on the plane. He's going back to his wife. Or she's just put her lover on the plane, and she, he's, she's going back to her husband, whom she can't stand, but she feels compelled to do so. The possibilities are endless. About four weeks later, I was having a break, and my idea of a break, I was actually hiking in Laos for a couple of weeks, and I was off to Australia, this is my first book break, and I was up in a little town called Luang Prabang, you have to love a town with a name like that, uh, and there was a German couple at uh, this inn I stopped in, looking very crusty, um, very dreadlocky, you can imagine four years down the line, he was probably going to be a banker in Frankfurt driving a BMW, which would be in <laughs> Chanel. But for the moment, they were doing this sort of post hippie thing. And they were having an argument, a rather bad domestic dispute. And the woman turned to this guy and said, Was du willst du? What do you want? And he turned to her and said, What a question. That immediately went into my notebook. And about three weeks later, on a trip back from Australia by plane to London at 24 of insanely long hours, I woke up from airplane sleep, and the entire idea for five days fell into my head. Why that works, I have no idea. But uh, after 11 novels, I know that you, know, you actually can never kind of ima uh, imagine that moment when the subconscious and some sort of narrative impulse cross. But something that was interesting to me a lot um, through my own experience and just also hearing the stories of others, especially my contemporaries, and you know, I was at an age where you know, half of people I knew were getting divorced, people were coming down with early cancers, just a lot of midlife adult stuff creeping in, it was also that notion of entrapment, uh, which is something everyone in one way or another struggles with. Um, my father and my mother had a, a marriage that was very much sort of out of a, a play by Strindberg. Um, it, yes, it was not calm, but it gave me a tremendous amount of material. And my father, who was um, always traveling and uh, had mistresses up and down South America, uh, when he was 70, he always stayed with her, uh, even though she was not the most easy of women. And when he was 70, we were having lunch in London, where I was living at the time. And I basically said, look, your three boys are gone. You know, you're out of a job. Um, you can go now, sell the apartment, one the asset they have, give her two thirds of it, buy the house you want in May, get the little boat, get the four boy four you always want. I bet you'll find a nice little community college where you can teach business. And I'm sure you'll meet a, woman, a very nice woman between the ages of 55 and 70 who'd be delighted to be with you. And he got furious and he's very Irish American, Brooklyn Catholic, <laughs> ex Marine Corps, Semper Fi way. Uh, he said, I took an oath. I took an oath. Don't you ever say that again. And then he started to shake. And that's when I saw just how scared he was once. We all construct an identity. I think
think that's something that is very interesting about life. Everyone here has constructed an identity. And even though I don't believe in kind of great bromides about life, great sweeping statements, over instance, or anything like that, there was one comment I came across from a German romantic poet named Novalis, who's completely forgotten. He was in the same era as Goethe. But this one comment is basically his, it's, it's probably on his headstone somewhere. It's certainly his legacy, and it's quite simple. Character is destiny. Think about that. Character is destiny. Is it our destiny to short change ourselves? Are we frequently selling ourselves short out of belief that we need to answer to a higher authority? It's like friends I know who, you know, were very talented in the arts but felt very much that, you know, after an expensive Eastern education, you know, they, they had to go off and become lawyers or the Wall Street types. Uh, or it's like women I know who always choose the wrong man. You know, the person who's after them, who's interesting, and then there's the man who's in his third 12-step program and, you know, is in bankrupt four times. And this friend of mine will always go for him. Um, is this self-sabotage of a profoundly subliminal nature? I think one of the interesting things I, I can say about life is that the biggest argument you have is with yourself, always. And then there's that whole idea of the life in parallel. The idea of you're living this life, but there's this other life you should be living at the same time. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Everything that way? We all do. I, I don't care where you are in life, I don't care how successful you are. There's a great line from a now rather forgotten American poet of the 1940s, Randall Jarrell, and he said, the way we miss life is life. Um, which is something I put up on a post it just when I was starting to write five days about which Laura, my narrator, is the uh, fifth time I've written in the voice of a woman. People always ask, how do I do this? It's not like I have a little captured estrogen that I place <laughs> under the arm. Um, um, I never really thought as a woman when I'm writing these characters. I wrote a novel called The Special Relationship, which is now a standard text uh, for the British Society of Postnatal Depression, because they said it's the one book that actually got it right. I never suffered one of those, but I did talk to one or two women who had gone through it. I think one thing, and I'm sure my fellow writer here would agree, that is essential in uh, a, a writer's toolbox, besides being a source and absorbing everything, is empathy. Uh, and looking at the lives of others, and actually looking about why, why and how they mess it up so much as we all do. Laura, my narrator, spends her day looking at other people's cancers. She's a 41-year-old technologist in a small radiography department of a very small main hospital on the main coast. Um, I, when I thought about this idea, I thought this is extraordinary. I had to go in for one of those common gardener scans and I could get into what it was and you could work it out. One of those things you have to do over 50. And I was flirting, I was single at the time, with the woman who was prepping me, who was very pretty. And I kept thinking, this, you know, and the woman before me, who had been going in, was hysterical and very nervous. And I was trying to pick this person up. Um, <laughs> and which she preferred, I must say, but she was married. Anyway, um, I kept thinking to myself, this is a person, and that was also, in a way, my own nervousness, sure. Just in a, in a kind of reverse way, trying to, you know, trying to be sort of over and cool about it. But no one likes these sort of things. And always, everyone wonders about the unknown and what could be there. I thought, what sort of person does this? Um, Laura has been doing this for about 15 years. She's in a marriage that has flatlined. Her husband, Dan, has been laid off of work for 18 months. He worked at Infotech at LLB, I don't like that detail. Uh, and was pushed off and cut back. She has two children riding the adolescent roller coaster, one at college, the other one about to go. So she's about to face up to empty nest. Um, the marriage is virtually dead, and she's starting to realize it was something she rushed into it expeditiously um, for a lot of reasons, most of which were wrong. And although they've carried on and it's not been bad, it's at that point where she's thinking, and now what? Especially with the kids gone in the air and me at the cusp of middle age or actually just entering it. And then she gets a chance to go to a medical conference in Boston for a weekend. It's a radiography conference. And I said that they particularly bad airport hotel because they always seem to be 
scheduled at her, her hotels. And while in line to check in, she meets a man called Darren, who is a rather great, unassuming fellow, lives in Maine, sells insurance, salesman's patter. She thinks a bit of a dart. And then they meet a few hours later by accident uh, in Cambridge and have a drink and get to talk. And what happens? You always read the book. <laughs> but for me, Frankly, the brief encounter is what the story is. It's so classic. One of my favorite films is David Lean's Brief Encounter, which people forget was written by Mel Cowley. I think you do know that. Um, but that idea of a meeting that can change everything, not so much in terms of you know, the earth moving, but actually the notion of possibility. I think that's something that people forget in life very often, uh, especially if you are kind of indentured to routine. And if you find your emotional horizon is kind of limited to begin with, in a way, you've constructed this life for yourself. That's one of the hardest things to face up to. The fact that actually, you know, when people talk about impediments in life, yes, things come into it. But everything, as far as I'm concerned, is trust. And whether you stay or go is another choice. Uh, but also, it's interesting, in Chinese, the symbol for crisis has two meanings, danger and opportunity. So are we attracted to the possibility of change without the complexity of change? Is that what a brief encounter is about? Do we fall in love with this person uh, because this is the right person for us, or because the timing is right, or because maybe the timing is all wrong, or because we are simply open to the possibility of love? In an earlier novel of mine, The Moment, a CIA man this also takes place in uh, century 1984 Berlin, so at the height of the Cold War, explains to my narrator, who's naively fallen into something that he shouldn't, um, the, the notion of radar. Uh, I don't know if you know how radar was invented, but during the 1940s, when essentially Britain was being pounded by U boats, the word came up from Churchill and the war cabinet to Cambridge, which was always the big scientific university of the two big ones, do something. And the scientists there, well, we've been actually already working on this in the US Navy, but they perfected it. But think about this with love. They basically discovered, you have two objects. A magnetic force is set up between the two objects. One object sends a signal out to the other, but what comes back from that object is not actually an actual representation of that object. It's the image that has been projected upon it. Do you wonder why there's so much divorce? <laughs> you know, the idea of actually projecting onto another person that which you so want, that which you so need, that which you so crave. You might not be looking at that object carefully. In this case, actually, it's pretty clear that they are very right for each other. They trigger something in themselves, and which has been long dormant, uh, and they actually discovered they were both very smart people. Um, you know, but then, of course, the, the question is, what do you do with this? Can you choose change, or do you choose unhappiness? Um, my mother is German Jewish, my father Irish Catholic, and was somewhere so omnipresent in my books, but my grandfather, who was the last man in the York, my maternal grandfather, who were spats, Milton Braun, who had a little diamond district business uh, and was in a, a marriage that even in my parents, so wonderful. Um, his favorite joke was, maybe you know this, was about a husband and wife in front of a divorce judge. And the judge says, Mr. Leibowitz, why do you want to leave your wife? She's a pain in the ass. Mrs. Leibowitz, he's a schmuck. <laughs> All right, I can see you're both incompatible, but, but let me ask you something. You're both 98 years old. Why have you waited so long to get a divorce? And the woman looks at him and goes, we wanted to wait until the children were dead. <laughs> <laughs> Do we stay put because we are frightened of the unknown or become, because happiness becomes actually, in a way, the weather system of our life? And that kind of comes down to sort of a larger question, which is behind this novel and, and behind actually really everything I write. I, I think the hardest question in life is the simplest. It's four words. What do you want? What do you want? It's an enormous question. Laura knows what she doesn't want, and uh, that's 
that's enormously positive, but to know what you want, I think that's actually the biggest battle we all face. And I think I'll leave it at that. So thank you. Do I need to grab a microphone, or can yeah. I just no, be, you're good. be loud? You're good. Go ahead. Clearly, I'm not a, a shrieking violin. Um, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I didn't allow myself to think about that. Um, I was very careful in writing Ava as a character that she wasn't like Anna in any real way. Um, and really, the material that I used was more about me intuiting how she felt in certain circumstances. So if she had said, I didn't feel that way, this is how I felt, I would say, is it okay for me to change it to say that and get her permission from there? Um, but I, I guess I was lucky. And I remember being a 13-year-old girl. It was miserable. <laughs> and I, you know, I couldn't imagine having, you know, my parents were married for 45 years, so I, I didn't have that circumstance. I truly, I hadn't gone through what she was going through. Um, so I did ask her lots of questions about what that felt like and, and how it made her feel when I showed up. I said, I said, I imagine it would feel like if my husband brought home another woman and said, hey, she's going to live here from now on. You know, you've had me to yourself for a while, but here she is. You know, and Anna laughed when I said that story. She goes, yeah, that's, I admit, and that's kind of how it felt. She's, you know, I was lucky, though. She was very gracious. I mean, I think there's a sort of a larger point here, which is actually about what do you use and how do you use it as a writer? And I mean, my attitude is, you know, I, I've never written something directly autobiographical, but there's a lot of me out everywhere. Um, there was this, there's a story you can download called The Mistake, um, and it's it's about an American lawyer who's having a post-divorce affair with a woman in Paris, another lawyer who's Swiss and is basically very professional and personally crazy. Now, I was involved with a crazy person after my divorce in Paris who was German. Um, and I changed a lot of the details, but it, it largely is what happened. Um, and someone said to me, do you think Heidi will be shocked by it? said never sleep with a writer. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> and, it, it, I, I, and honestly, you know, guilty as charged. Yes. Um, you know, my ex-wife went through a bankruptcy. I used that in the novel as well. It was disguised. I mean, I'm also kind of, shall we say, attuned to the notion of libel and, and also, you know, to the idea of not, you know, shall we say, upsetting my children's sensibilities. Um, it is their mother, and it was disguised in a certain way where, you know, actually it was a man who was going through which this woman, my wife went through. But, you know, this is this is how we operate. I can't imagine that you can't bring in yeah. something that's not autobiographical yeah. into the work. Yeah, no, I mean, this is basically how we operate. And, uh, you know, as I said earlier, you know, I'm a sponge. You know, tell me something at your peril, you know, it will be taken. I don't have a I remember, you know, everything that was said. Um, but, you know, this is just how everyone has always worked. Graham Greene, who's one of my great heroes, mm -hmm. wrote The End of the Affair, which is essentially about a relationship that he had with a married woman who he was crazy about, you know, and who's one of the seniors of the service. Uh, and, I mean, it's infused with a lot of his Catholic guilt. But, I mean, you know, this is kind of peace. Yeah, it, I would agree with that. I mean, yeah. There have been certain aspects of my novels that have been fairly autobiographical, but then something more sort of tangentially relational to something I've gone through. I wrote Outside the Lines, which is a story of a woman who is searching for her homeless and mentally ill father. She had been estranged for 20 years. He had sort of a break when he was 10, when she was 10 years old, and sort of you get to I do flashbacks back and forth between 
present when she is looking for him because he's been out of her life for 20 years, and then back when she was 10 years old, the year that he really starts to fracture and his mental illness takes over and he's not medicated, and, and you get to see her reaction then, and then later the reason that she's looking for him. Now, my father was not mentally ill. I wasn't estranged for him for, from, for 20 years, but I didn't have necessarily the kind of relationship with him that I wish I would have. And the idea for the book actually came to me after my father had passed away about six years ago. And I had a dream that I was walking along a beach in Seattle and I saw a blue tarp and I lifted it up and it was my father and he was homeless. You could just tell he was just, you know, starving and beaten up. And I said, I had this overwhelming feeling that I had been looking for him. And I said, there you are. And I woke up and I just felt like it felt so incredibly real to me. And it just, it, that's the seed of the story. So what happened to, to me in writing that story was that I was really able to work through sort of my own wish for what my relationship with my father could have been and what I could have done, you know, if I had found, if he had been the kind of father that I sort of idealized him to be. Um, so with Eden, the main character, you know, doing that with her father, I got to sort of insert some of my stuff in there. But the story itself, the plot, had not happened to me. I, I mean, I think another thing is also all novels in one way or another are about a problem. You know, you, I mean, this is you know, this goes back to the drama, but it, it's very much about a problem. Right? Can you, and, you know, if, if someone says to me, well, there's always some kind of marriages in your book, um, or people's lives are falling apart and all this, I'll just say, well, two things. One, um, everyone loves the nightmare. Also, I mean, can you imagine the big bad wolf and the three little pigs without the, the big bad wolf? I mean, you know, what do we have then? A house of straw, a house of bricks, a house of sticks. What now? They form a residence association? I mean, there's, there's nowhere to go. So, I mean, yeah, I, when, when you think about it, you've got to have the big bad wolf, so to speak. Metaphor. I know when people hear about what I've written about, I've written about mothers and alcoholism, homelessness, and mental illness. Um, I, Language of Sisters, which is about a handicapped girl who is raped in an institution and ends up pregnant, and her family, you know, dealing with that. And I mean, they're like, oh my God, books to slit your wrist by. But it's not, you know, truly, I don't set out to write about happy, perfect things because I don't think anyone in this world has a happy, perfect life. And I think that what is interesting to me about my characters and other characters and reading other books is, you know, how do people get through that? How do they struggle and grow and face challenges or, you know, fall down in the face of them? You just, um, it's very interesting to me. And what are all those many different factors that impress upon us our behaviors? And here comes my sociological background, right? I'm very interested in how society shapes who we are as individuals. And, um, and how unaware a lot of people are about the decisions that they make based on that. And so when I, when I pick socially relevant issues, you know, I have a bit of an agenda because I like to start conversations about uncomfortable topics. I like people to maybe think or feel something acrimonious towards something I've written because then I've, I've made them think a little bit about their own preconceptions and their own um, assumptions about the people that go through situations like being a mother and an alcoholic or a homeless mental ill person. You know, all of those things, that's very important to me. I, I mean, I was recently in France at the big salon de Livre and I have a huge reading from France and I, it's my other language. And a woman came up to me at the salon and just took my hand and said basically, uh, you've actually got me through a very difficult period with your novel Leave the World, keep it in the French. Uh, and she explained that her four year old daughter had died of cancer and Leave the World is among other things about the death of the child. And she said, I understood I wasn't alone. That was the most wonderful thing anyone could ever say to me. I mean, I thought I'd done my job. Um, I think, you know, Ian e. Forrester said basically the role of the artist is always connect. And, you know, what I always try to do in my own fiction, besides making me turn the page and stay up late, is also to kind of address what I call the big stuff, the kind of harder questions that we all face without answers. I'm not a priest. I'm not, you know, I'm not Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a Scientologist. I don't have answers um, whatsoever. I just have a lot of questions about how we muddle through. You, you both.
both write about the same topic in two totally different sure. uh, ways. Mm -hmm. And listening to the two of you, Amy goes at it through the heart, and you go at it through more of a, a sarcastic bite to it to bring us back to where Maybe you want us to be. So when, I, when I write, it's different. Is it different? Well, then I'm going to have to read. No, it's, I'm very different. Okay. <laughs> because when you write, you have a bit of a, a, a bite to what you're saying. Well, there's a bite. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a European, I was an American intellectual. I mean, there you go. Okay. <laughs> With yeah. Jewish background, so I mean. Yeah, no. There it is. You know, uh, yeah. It's very interesting. I, I, I was raised in Manhattan. I mean, yeah. I know people are always saying that they're always amazed at how cheerful and, yeah. and bubbly I am yeah, I mean, compared to the really negative yeah. things that I write no, but, about. I, but I actually write in a very emotional way. But, it, but I, I also, there is a cerebral part to my work, which I like. Uh, it does make you think, but it will make you feel very strong. But that's what I'm saying. You both come at it, but in very different ways. And yeah. that's, it's very uh, yeah. interesting to, I can't wait to pick up some books. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> when you're taking a break from writing, who do you read? Mm -hmm. um, I read so many different people. I mean, I, I, I have my hotel room in Manhattan. I have James Salter's memoir, of Burning the Days. I have a book by an East German writer who recently died called Krista Wolf about her period of exile in the States after the war. But I mean, I, but I'm, I've got usually Catholic texts, and I'm, I, I, I must read 200 books a year. I'm, my wife, I'm married to my second marriage, and it's Montreal, it's the other city. I'm married to a Canadian psychoanalyst, not my, but, uh, but basically she was one of the fastest readers she's ever seen. I read everything. Um, I'm much more of an escapist reader, um, so I would <laughs> take a while to get through those, I think. I really like to be just transported as a, as a reader, and so I read I read a lot of literary fiction. Um, probably one of my all-time favorite authors uh, is Elizabeth Berg. She was actually, uh, when I was 24, and a you know, unemployed sociologist working in a French pastry shop. Um, <laughs> at at, at three like o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and you know, folding pastry to make croissants and where all of those. Where, where oh, up in Bellingham, Washington, oh, near the Canadian border. Right. And um, I read Talk Before Sleep. Oh, I just picked it up, and it was probably the most perfect novel I've ever read. I. It's, it's short, it's spare, it's beautiful, it's heart-wrenching, it's funny, it's perfectly, a perfect description of how women really are with each other. And I remember closing that book, reading the last line, and just holding it to my chest the way you do when you read a really good book, and being just like, Ugh. and I thought, if, if someone can write this book, then, then I, I need to at least try. You know, screw that college professor, basically. <laughs> and. Um, and then later that day, I, I happened upon Anais Nin's quote, you know, the longer you're, and then she realized the longer she stayed as a bunch, or well, anyway, I can never say it, you probably know it by heart. Anyway, the, lot, <laughs> the risk of staying in a bed was, you know, more painful than it took to blossom, basically. Mm -hmm. And that I took that as sort of my little message from the universe that I should quit my pastry job. Anyone who's written has been turned out lots. Yes. Anyone who's written has been told you're crap.
all writing careers are hard one, and once you actually establish, there is the thing of just continuing. Yeah, it's why I admire some of the enormous people like Philip Roth. Roth was written off in the 1980s by a lot of critics, uh, and then came back to the Sabbath Theater and especially the American Hospital and American Communist in the state. I mean, an immense kind of uh, nemesis, and actually my favorite, which is uh, Every Man. A novel that meant a lot to me as a novelist, and it got known because of this film, but when I first came across it, I had been sent by the Observer newspaper in London to go to, they thought I would be a good person for this, to go to Branson, uh, which is a terrible kind of, it's the Las Vegas country in Western music, and it's one of those awful honky-tonk towns in the world. I had one couple days there. And on the way back in a bookshop in Kansas City, I happened to a novel that I kept meaning to read for years, the writer was just dead, and that was John Yates' Revolutionary Road, which is all set around here in Connecticut. And it's essentially, it was filmed then, about 15 years later, with DiCaprio and Winslet. Actually, you know, even later, it was filmed about, it was filmed about, well, it was about 15 years after that, it was seven or eight. Um, it's the story of a couple who meet in New York after the war. They're, he's out of the army, uh, she's working as a secretary. They have sort of Bohemian Greenwich Village pretensions, but they're talented. She gets pregnant, he gets a rather boring job, and they move to the birds, uh, and begin to tear each other apart. It's about a classic post-war American marriage. It's about the burgeoning bur 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 suburb, but what it's most about is self-entrap, and the terror of putting yourself into a life that you don't want, and yet how you dig yourself deeper and deeper. Um, I remember reading it on that flight back to London, uh, and I was reading my marriage, I was reading all about their generation, but also there were resonances in all generations. I mean, the modern novel began actually for me with Madame Bovary. Uh, why? Uh, besides it being quite revolutionary, the story of a small town doctor's wife in near Rouen in France who begins to dalliance with an army officer, is a novel which actually tackles one of the key problems in life, which is boredom. You know, uh, it's it's very florid. I've read it both in French and English, and it's got a, it's, it's also very pre-Freudian. But for the first time, this was a desperate housewife, <laughs> uh, quite simply. You know, uh, and in her final depression, which ends with her suicide, she begins to shop compulsively and lands herself at the great death. Uh, it, it's quite modernist in its scope, but also what it looks at so profoundly is the idea, it's what Kierkegaard said, the sickness unto death is despair. Uh, and how boredom, and especially a boredom that you've created through your choices, is so critical. So yeah, Yeats' Revolutionary Railroad, it remains a great book, mm -hmm. and bleak as hell. Um, I'm an avid reader, and I read like that. But I wonder how you feel about e-readers. I still like pages. I love, I don't, I, I mean, I, I have an iPad, I've, I've tried it, it's not for me. But, I, but it's, Same thing, yeah. I don't have one. Yeah. No interest. I'm a book girl. So I you mean, travel with time. I, I see it, I, I, recently I was on a flight from San Francisco to Seattle on a book thing, and I walked up the Alpha's bathroom and I counted, and about 200 people on the flight, there were 78 people with either Kindles or mm -hmm. iPads reading. So my feeling about it is, I don't think it's the end of the book in the same way that I don't think television was the end of the movies. It's a different format. It is, it is now becoming just as all of our public television and we are culture on the same time and age, it's 25% of the market. So, you know, attention must be paid to this book as well. Um, it's a way of, I'm just happy to see people that's good. I like that. Um, I'm always, you know, if I'm on a subway or a metro or the underground in London, I like my tweet. Uh, I'm always looking at what people are reading. Um, and if they are reading on Kindles, I don't care. But I'm with Madame, I'm, I'm a book reader. Anyone else? Okay. You can stay and talk. And
we also have books for sale over there and the Reading Society. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.